modernist architecture is very often under-recognized, and modern buildings are very often too young to qualify for landmark designation. And that's why we know, in a very visionary move from know, and I see some initiators of the program here um, in this room, um, we decided in 2008 to create the World Monuments for Null Modernism Prize to raise awareness about modern preservation success stories. Too often we talk about problematic places, so we thought, okay, for once, let's celebrate a great example of what can be done. So we are really proud this year uh, to award the, pra the prize to the first um, project that was selected for South America. It's the first time that we award the World Monuments for Null Modernism pr uh, Prize to a monument in South America. Uh, the Casa Sobre del Arroyo is an architectural icon of Argentinian modernism and a symbol of national pride for Argentina. And today we were talking with the architects and people involved in the restoration, and they were telling us that it's such an important building for the country. And that's why, in fact, when we announced the prize, we received like so much press, especially from Argentina, because people got really excited about the fact that they receive uh, this prize. And, um, and just recently, I was listening to a podcast by Adriano Pedrosa, the, architect, uh, the artistic director of the Venice Biennale this year. And what was interesting is that he was saying that part of his curation of the Venice Biennale that will soon start, uh, one of his focuses was on the stories of modernism in the global south and how these ideas and stories and architectural components were absorbed in the global south, digested, mixed with local elements to make really a movement of their own. And I think today it's really important to recognize that, that Modernism in the global size takes many different shapes and has really been integrated by uh, local communities and countries and is part of their identity. This is a matter of interest to us as well at World Monuments Fund. We are very involved in uh, several places preserving modernism sites. For example, we have a major project of restoring the Mosul Museum in Iraq, um, in Mosul. And uh, that's um, a place that is very iconic because it was created and designed by Mohammed Makiya, who is one of the most important modernist architects in Iraq. Uh, we are also involved in a project to highlight the legacy of Minet da Silva, very important modern architect in Sri Lanka. And we have many other modern projects in India, in Africa. So tonight I'm looking forward to learning more about uh, modernism in South America. So I would like to thank all the participants in the winning project, especially Fabio Gremantieri, who is here, and uh, Magali uh, Marazzo, who came all the way from Argentina to be here representing, in fact, the large team of people who made that project possible. It's a pleasure to welcome you tonight. I also want to thank the Consul of Argentina, uh, Monsieur le Consul, Guillermo Olivares, uh, Olivares uh, who is joining us here tonight. Of course, I want to thank all our jury members because they spent so much time, and this year was the year when we received the most nomination, and I can tell you, they take this extremely seriously, and it's a very hard thing to win the prize. So congratulations to our Argentinian friends. Um, we are also uh, taking this opportunity to highlight and celebrate the legacy of Jean-Louis Cohen, who was one of the founders of the uh, Null Modernism Prize. Uh, many of you know him. He was a luminary. He was an extraordinary architectural historian, a friend to many of us. And unfortunately, he passed away last summer, so we're going to start the event with a, a short tribute uh, to him. Um, so uh, the prize has now existed for 15 years. It's one of its kind in the world. There is no other prize like that, and that's why it's so cherished to us, because it's essential for preservation of modernist heritage. I want also to thank my team, uh, Javier Orsortin, who is really the one making everything happen. Uh, along with his colleague, and Julie Rovo, who is there organizing this whole event tonight, Beth Harrison uh, in the development team, who is making sure that we get the support, and uh, of course the, the Noel team, as well as Veronica uh, Schaffin, who is organizing the celebration afterwards. Um, so thank you all. Um, our 
estimated share of the committee is going to introduce in a little while uh, the, um, the tribute to, um, to Jean-Louis Cohen. But, so I want to introduce him now because I won't come back on stage. Uh, so Barry is the Mayor Shapiro Professor of Art History at Columbia University. Um, he has very broad interest, uh, but many of them are centered on modern architectural architect uh, history. He's trained in art history rather than architecture and is, has an approach most closely allied with cultural history and the history and sociology of professions. Between 2007 and 2013, Barry served as the Philip Johnson chief curator at the Museum of Modern Art. So we are really here in like modern neighborhood of New York, um, and uh, is, um, is, he has so many functions at Columbia, the Prisker Prize. I'm not going to do the whole list because it's endless. We will be here until tonight. But for us, he's also the founding chairman of the World Monuments Fund No Modernism Prize, and we are so, so grateful for everything he does for World Monuments Fund, so thank you. So now, without further ado, I would like to invite Katie Kim, who is the Vice President of Knoll Brand Marketing, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I recognize I'm standing between now and the main event. I'll keep this quick. Um, I'm very honored to represent Knoll here this evening. Um, as uh, mentioned, Noel is a founding partner of this um, incredible prize, and it's been awarded since 2008, the eighth such prize. That's incredible. So thank you to our partners at the World Monuments Fund. We are just so proud to be stewards of this important work. Um, we thank you for your partnership, and we just look forward to our continued relationship. Um, at Noel, modern design is just so fundamental to our story. It's really more than just a guiding principle. It's our roots, it, it guides where we go next as a company. And so much like our kindred spirits in architecture and, and planning and preservation, we really deeply value the importance of design and how it connects people to their surrounding environment, both at a, the smallest of scales, the largest of scales. So this year's um, prize recip recipient is truly such an exemplar of how design is in harmony with its environment. We're so excited and thrilled to, to hear more. Um, we commend the outstanding work of all of the advocacy groups. Just seeing this project from start to finish must be so thrilling. Um, and thank you also to the um, Ministries of Culture and Public Works in Argentina, the municipality, and we look forward to hearing more. So thank you again. Have a wonderful evening. So good evening, everyone. Thanks to everyone for, for coming. And an early congratulations from my part to, uh, to our friends and colleagues from Argentina for, uh, uh, to receive the award tonight. I just want to say a few words about the prize, and then I thought we would uh, see a video that's been prepared as a tribute to our late friend, uh, Jean-Louis Cohen. So it has, for me, been a huge honor and pleasure to be involved with the prize since its very first edition, as you just heard, in 2008, and having helped compose the jury. The prize, as you've heard, has at least a two, uh, for me, has at least a twofold mission. To recognize, celebrate, and award exemplary work in the restoration of important works of modernist architecture, often with an urban or landscape dimension, and equally important, to achieve greater recognition of the unique challenges of saving modernist heritage by shining a spotlight, and this photograph does seem really to shine a spotlight, uh, on often heroic tales of buildings, as you will hear again this evening, oft times buildings brought back from the brink of disappearance. The integrity and quality of the restoration are only part of what is recognized by this award. Equally, it is the skill of mounting a campaign, which is as much a political and human as it is technical and financial as an accomplishment. The exemplary outcome, as well as the often heroic undertaking, the story once again of this restoration, we might say is what the Knoll World Monuments Fund Modernism Prize sets out to bring into public awareness, to encourage others to attend to the peril of so many of the accomplishments of modernism, one of the first architectural movements to have a truly global reach. Tonight, we celebrate for the first time an important restoration accomplishment uh, in the decade and a half of the prize located in South America, and in particular a work that was celebrated in its youth, but left to what seemed like an almost tragic death 
only to be rescued and made into, as you will learn soon, a site open to the public who now can appreciate one of the most original creations of 20th century architecture anywhere, not only in Argentina with its fervent experimentation in modernism in the middle decades of the last century. The only sad note in this evening's award ceremony is the loss, as you've already heard from Benedict, of one of the most cherished collaborators, the architectural historian, architect, writer, and tireless advocate for the built environment, Jean-Louis Cohen. Jean-Louis was a great friend, not only to me, but I speak for many, many of you here tonight who could say exactly the same things that I'm about to say. But he was equally a great friend to nearly every meaningful work of architecture created in the last century and a half. He was not a passive observer, but an advocate for saving and restoring so many buildings. Over the half year now since his tragic departure, he has been celebrated already in many of the cities where he was as much at home in the streets and in the institutions, and generally also in the language, uh, from Russia to Germany to the Netherlands to the United States, where he taught here for many years at NYU, to Morocco, and of course to his native France to perhaps something, I guess, like three-fifths of the member states of the United Nations. For myself and my fellow jurors for this prize, he was an invaluable colleague and voice, as conversant with the original history of a hefty percentage of the sites nominated as he was with the actuality of the restoration. He knew almost all of them, and he had lectured or written about them. Generally, he had already been there. And since no matter where you went, Jean-Louis had already been there as I found out most painfully when I arrived a half an hour after him in the best secondhand and rare bookshop in Bucharest years ago, only to meet him leaving already with all the best first editions of the key German architectural books that I thought had been waiting there for me, alas. Yes, Jean-Louis was already there before. He wasn't with us this year to award the prize, to help us with the deliberations, to share his firsthand knowledge, or to help in crafting the citation and tonight's video. But of course, he had already summed it up in his own indispensable textbook with the English title, The Future of Architecture Since 1889, published in 2012. There he writes of the Casa Sobre El Arroyo, discussing the architectural contributions from the 1930s and 1940s in South America, Jean-Louis writes. But the most varied and intense production was in Argentina. The young Amancio Williams, proponent of, the, proponent of the laconic and minimalist interpretations of Le Corbusier's project, designed an astonishing house in Mar del Plata for his father, the composer Alberto Williams, an inhabitable bridge in the spirit of Maillard. We'll hear more about Maillard shortly, straddling a stream. I know he would have been as impressed with the laureate this year as we are. Like so many, we will miss his vast knowledge base his wise counsel, his agility in coming to a difficult group decision, his humanity, and his humor. Let's watch a tribute to him in video. I think the first word that comes to mind, awesome. To describe Jean-Louis in one word is really difficult. Jean-Louis was open, open to different ideas, you know, open to different kinds of people. C'était, je sais pas, pour moi c'était un géant. Un géant, euh, voilà, il était, il était immense dans, dans, dans son savoir, dans sa manière, dans ses... il était unique. Kind and generous, I think I remember him most fondly as a really warm and gracious, wonderfully engaging um, partner in conversation. I think another word that is equally important is connector. Jean-Louis was not only connecting things that happened in the past in new ways so that we would understand, but he was also connecting people today who were concerned with these things. Our first interaction, he immediately started speaking to me in Russian, which I don't speak very well at all. <laughs> His emails were usually in either Italian, French, as often as in English. He connaissait tout, il avait une mémoire inouïe. Et puis enfin, il parlait russe, donc c'était très facile. Il parlait aussi l'allemand. Bon, je parlais aussi quelques langues, mais, mais lui, c'était une folie. C'était vraiment, vraiment impressionnant et sympathique à la fois. Je ne connais pas quelqu'un d'autre qui a eu un such an énorme output de publication de books et d'exhibitions. Et il a écrit ce que je pense est le meilleur texte sur l'architecture du 20e siècle, le futur de l'architecture. 
and did all these books on Corbusier in Russia and uh, of course Frank Gehry uh, recently and and expanded at the same time the discourse by looking at the global south and uh, looking at topics that others hadn't really uh, studied. I'm thinking of that book on Casablanca. So he was immensely impactful for uh, the field. He was looking at a way of understanding the 20th century that would take in all of the complexities of the international collaborations. One that would not see the years of conflict, particularly the First and Second World War, as interruptions in architectural culture. He would see them uh, in a very provocative way, in a very profound way. The, but the project that really um, synthesized this effort, or maybe we might say was its leading edge, was a project called Architecture in Uniform, which was both a book and an exhibition at the Canadian Centre for Architecture. Extremely important and one that I think uh, was the place where he finally brought into one situation something that he had been working at from different angles for, for many years. Lui, il avait une connaissance inouïe euh, qui était la connaissance des livres. Et comme il avait une formation d'architecte, il comprenait tout. Ce n'était pas simplement un, un historien. Il, il, il voyait les choses, il voyait les couleurs, il, il, il voyait les choses en trois dimensions. And a lot of the things that I think that he was interested in was kind of extracting um, moments of kind of decency which is kind of what architecture does at its best at very difficult times. And I think that's one of the reasons he was so interested in, let's say, the late 20s and the Soviet Union. If you look at his most important texts, for example, um, a lot of them had to do with connections between places, um, connections between Americanism, for example, in the Soviet Union, or the relationship between Berlin and Moscow, or between Moscow um, and Paris. I think it was these cultural connections that interested him more than other people. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons he built these kinds of different networks. So it was this kind of this movement of ideas from one culture to another, from one person to another, it was what was so interesting about the way he viewed architecture. You know? And I think that was very different. It made him very important in terms of how he helped us understand the way cultures impact each other over time. speaking French was a recipient of the prize a number of years ago for her work on the extraordinary restoration of the Karl Marx school in Villejuif. I won't read you from Jean-Louis textbook about that project but he writes very um, insightfully about it. You might wonder how in the world he had time for us but he was always there with us for the with the prize helping us with the discussion we miss him really greatly. Let me turn it over to Javier who is going to guide us to Argentina. Thank you, Ari, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Javier Ors Ausin, and I am a program manager at World Monuments Fund, where, among other things, I oversee our World Monuments Fund Null Modernism Prize. And it is a great honor for me to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I, um, a lot has been said already by Benedict and Barry, but I would also add that this year has been particularly special for the Modernism Prize because we are honoring this uh, project, but also because it's been actually the most competitive year since we the prize started in 2008. We received the highest number of nominations ever submitted to the prize, and that is an important highlight uh, and why this, uh, the selection of this pro project is even more important for us tonight. Uh, we are now going to move to a panel discussion. Um, but before we do that, uh, just some logistics, we are going to play a video to introduce the winner, La Casa Sobre el Arroyo, uh, to all of you. And before we see the video, let me introduce the panelists so that we can then uh, continue with the conversation right away after the, the video. Uh, Barry Bergdahl is going to join us in the panel, but I won't introduce him because he's been already introduced and you all know him. Uh, but we will also be joined by Susan McDonald who is a member of our jury. And Susan is the head of the Buildings and Sites Department at the Getty Conservation Institute in California, where she oversees a portfolio of international projects aimed to advance conservation practice across a variety of challenges. 
Susan is trained as an architect and has been involved in a wide range of conservation projects from urban planning, development, economics, policy, technical matters. She oversees the Getty Conservation Institute's Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative and has been involved in several World Heritage nominations as well as publishing widely on this topic. She is currently the co-president of the ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on 20th Century Heritage. As I said before, she's also a member of our jury. And I also want to introduce our two panelists who are coming from Argentina, uh, Magali Marazzo. Uh, Magali is a member of the National Commission of Monuments, Places, and Historical Assets in Argentina, an organization that is responsible for the study and conservation of the national architectural heritage, providing technical assistance for conservation and restoration of the monuments nationwide. Magali is a museologist and a cultural manager and is the Argentine representative in the Modern Architecture Group for the Cultural Heritage Commission of Mercosur. Uh, Magali worked as the director of the Secretaría de Obras y Planeamiento Urbano de Mar del Plata and has been the director of the Casa sobre el Arroyo until very recently, just a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, she inaugurated, together with the Argentine president and the ministries of culture and public works, uh, the restored house last April of 2023. And lastly, uh, let me introduce Fabio Grementieri. Fabio is a partner at the architectural practice G plus K and the director of the preservation program at the Universidad Torquato di Tela. He has conducted preservation projects at many historic sites in Argentina and at many private and public landmarks of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, Fabio has also curated and organized many different international conferences on modern architecture and architecture in Argentina, and is a member of the National Commission of Monuments of Argentina from 2017 to 2022, and has held several prominent advisory roles, including advisory to the Ministry of Culture uh, of the City of Buenos Aires and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, and he was the project manager of a couple Getty Grant projects for the National Museum of Decorative Arts in Buenos Aires and for the Escuela Manuel Belgrano in Córdoba. He received the Henry Hope Reed Award in 2009. And among other titles, Grementieri has authored Argentina Natural and Cultural Heritage in 2008 and Buenos Aires Capital of Entertainment in 2008. These are our panelists, and before we uh, pass to the move to the panel, let's watch a video to introduce the site to everyone. In 1943, the already very well-known Argentinian composer, musician, Alberto Williams, commissioned his son, very young architect, only recently out of architecture school, to design a second house for them on a beautiful wooded site in the seaside town of Mar del Plata. Williams was trained both as an architect and engineer, Amancio the Sun, and was fascinated by the spatial possibilities rendered by the importation of construction reinforced concrete into residential architecture, but also fascinated from an early age by flying. So he was eager to take what is inspiring him in architecture in the modern movement that wanted very much an architecture of the time, of today, of modernity, of modern industrial technology, and combine it with his love of flying. In other words, Amancio Williams wanted to make an architecture that floated in the sky, that was released from the forces of gravity, that seemed somehow to levitate, to take daily life up to a new plane. La Casa Sobre el Arroyo was selected as the winner of the 2024 World Monuments Fund Null Modernism Prize, not only because they did a very rigorous and detailed conservation intervention at the project and restoration, but also to celebrate the many years of work and efforts by a group of advocates who 
work with other members of the community as well as with the government to protect the site, restore it, and open it to the public. To create a house that was liberated from the ground, Mansfield Williams came up with the idea that rather than building the house on the marshy wet banks of this small stream, to actually make it into a bridge that would allow the family to move from one side of the property to the other across the stream, but also, in a sense, float the house in the air above the brook, hence the name of the house to this day, the Casa Sobre El Arroyo, the house over the stream. La Casa Sobre el Arroyo was included in the 2012 uh, World Monuments Watch in support to a grassroots group that was advocating for the protection and preservation of the house, essentially to support their efforts, their advocacy efforts towards the preservation of the Casa Sobre el Arroyo. Following the watch inclusion in the years after that, the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Public Works and the Municipality of Mar del Plata got together to uh, protect the house and implement a conservation project that ultimately would preserve the house in the way we see it today. The conservation of La Casa Sobre el Arroyo is also the first project that we ever selected at the Modernism Prize that is located in South America, in the Global South, and that is also quite important because it's important for all of us to celebrate the work that many architects are doing in the Global South to preserve and protect modern architecture that, as I said before, quite often is under threat. This has been the work of many historians and preservation specialists over the last generation to recalibrate the history of modern architecture, to understand that it was taking at wellsprings around the globe, that it was not simply the translation of ideas from one or two artistic centers in Europe to other places that were copies or epigons of an original that was founded elsewhere, but that in fact modernism was a global phenomenon. So we're especially proud this year to give the award to one of the most important buildings in the modernism coming from Latin America, a building that was almost erased from the map and which has now regained its, its place back uh, on the map in the timeline of innovative modernist architecture globally. Working. Is it working? Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the panel. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, the four of you, but particularly you two, coming all the way from Argentina uh, for this uh, for this event. I want to start off by asking a question to both of you, Magali and Fabio. Um, we now know a little bit more about the house and all the work that you've done over the years, and. I would like, you know, you both are uh, locals from Argentina, are practitioners in the heritage world, and have been involved in this project. And I would like if you can tell us, from your point of view, a bit more about why this house is so historically, socially, and architecturally significant for you uh, and for Argentina, but particularly for you. Maybe we can start with you, Magali. Okay, thank you. First of, first of all, uh, thank you to all of you to stay here. And for me, it's a huge, it, it's, it's really, um, I'm, I don't know how to say, I'm very emotion, <laughs> emotional <laughs> at, for, for this prize. For me, it's very important because this house, it's, uh, it's part of me. 20 years I've been, yeah, I've been <laughs> working in this project, so for me it's very, very important. Um, this house, it's very important for all, all my city. In, Mar in Argentina, we have uh, this city, who is a tourist city, and, 
And it's very important because um, this, this house, I don't know if maybe Fabio can help me because it's yeah. a little bit difficult for me. I'm very nervous. Well, like it's okay. No, no, yeah, time. but I don't know if the people can <laughs> understand me. So it's better if we speak both yeah. about why yeah. this, this house is important. Yeah. This, yes, uh, Mar del Plata is the most important uh, holiday city in Argentina. It's a summer resort, it's on the beach. And almost all Argentines has been at, at least once in Mar del Plata. Uh, has, has been founded in the late uh, 19th century. Was a summer resort, uh, sort of uh, pretending, emulating uh, uh, Biarritz in the South Atlantic for wealthy families of Argentina, spending the the, the summer there. Uh, it is was fulfilled with uh, different cottages and architecture. As, uh, of vacation architecture, uh, 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 inspiring in, in, in the architecture of uh, summer resorts and beaches in Europe mostly. And then uh, along the, the 20th century, century, the evolution of the city uh, was completed with uh, high-rise buildings and other buildings. And uh, well, among all these this sort of architecture of the place emerged the Casa del Puente, or Casa Sobre el Arroyo. I, I mentioned Casa del Puente is a, a house uh, on the bridge or house of the bridge because it was uh, the second name, the Casa Sobre el Arroyo, got in the 1960s, in the 1960s isn't, yeah. isn't it? Because uh, it was sold then uh, to uh, uh, a company was that, that had a radio station, and uh, they named it Casa del Puente. Even the slogan, uh, when they, they transmit it, they say, from the Casa del Puente, from the uh, house of the bridge, a bridge to your home. Uh, so popularly, it's mostly known as Casa del Puente. Instead, specialists, architects, and uh, scholars all over the world, they know it as Casa Sobre el Arroyo. And uh, well, it has been built in the, during the Second World War, 1943. You know, everywhere in the world there was little built at the time. That was not the case in South America and particularly in Argentina. And the project is uh, of these uh, two architects, uh, Amancio Williams, is, uh, is almost the only complete uh, building that he built because he, he made designs for all yeah. kind of uh, project, urban, even high-rise buildings. Well, hospital, the famous uh, reinforced concrete umbrellas uh, that he designed. Uh, he worked uh, for the government, for private companies, even for uh, Juan Perón and Evita Perón in the 1940s. At some point, he asked Le Corbusier to receive Evita Perón uh, when she visited Europe and she, when she visited Paris in order to complete a project to, for Buenos Aires, uh, the urban project for Buenos Aires. So it, it has many, many different meanings for politically, socially, architecturally, culturally, and uh, and even for for uh, common people that uh, have a, a relation with the city and with this sort of architecture uh, for vacation, that this is one of the best represent representatives of of, of this uh, type of uh, architecture. Well, now understanding this whole history and connections between Amancio Ortega and so many different layers of the cultural world and political world of Argentina. It really makes sense the collaboration that was fostered for the preservation of the of the site, that in many ways I feel that represents the spirit of preservation that really fosters um, grassroots movements, people moving to uh, preserve and advocate for a for a site, but also fosters collaboration and cooperation between different stakeholders and government agencies. And even that's Political areas or political sectors or parties inside the country or even <laughs> municipal government. So in fact, could you tell us a bit more about the process? Yes, because and this case, uh, so Magali issues. was a in very important. As I, I was saying, in French, you have the maître d'ouvrage and maître d'oeuvre. 
the Maitre Dubras is, uh, is a sort of the owner and who is very interested in the house, uh, how it's going to be built and how it's going to be restored. So Magali was a sort of uh, Maitre Dubras. And then the Maitre d'Evre, it was a sort of, uh, it's a team composed by different uh, uh, professionals, by different, uh, uh, of different specialty, of different fields, uh, you know, uh, people of conservation, architects, and also the, the officials of the different areas in the different ministers uh, that put together this <laughs> sort of uh, complex uh, project from different points of view from, uh, well, that has been also uh, very much supported by the descendants of Amancio Williams, particularly Claudio Williams, his, one of his sons, that uh, took in charge preserving the whole archive of Amancio Williams that now is, is uh, at the CCA, the Sa Canadian Center for Architecture. So uh, there were m many different stakeholders. And, uh, for uh, in the case of the modern heritage, it's very important to consult as far as possible, and this case was exceptional, all the documents, all the drawings that were there, uh, kept by the family of this uh, project, from uh, the layer, general layout, the alternatives for different, uh, yeah, all, all, all details, uh, pictures, photographs, uh, uh, the, all the, the, the text or the specifications, so all was kept and all was part of the initial uh, uh, work uh, for to, to, to produce a project and then and then the second part was to uh, uh, have it uh, uh, done and in this case the officials and the different connections between the different uh, uh, stakeholders in the ministries, in the, the municipality of Mar de Plata, with uh, Magali coordinating and pushing <laughs> in every place uh, the, the will uh, that everybody in Mar de Plata, in many parts of Argentina, had to get this restored. And it finally occurred, fortunately, and uh, well, this is uh, the result. And it was Thank celebrated uh, by the media in Argentina, the people of Mar del Plata, of course. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Fabio, for all <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's very important for us to, to do this restoration. Fabio, too, he, he was one of the, of the most important people in the restoration because he's on the um, uh, monument in the commission of monuments so in in this case the he's i don't know siguiendo el proceso following all following the process, all the process oh. so i'm very nervous uh, following all this process mm -hmm. and and he worked a lot with but me the, but the, the also as the expectations were very important uh, what was also really very important is to transmit and to diffuse all the different steps of yeah. the uh, restoration. Yeah, so. In this case, with Magali and uh, other people from the National Commission of Monuments, uh, well, we produce uh, uh, sort of uh, documentaries and even classes uh, for different people in the YouTube channel of the National Commission of Monuments where we presented the different steps and communicate what was going on uh, for, on the works of the, for the resolution of Casa Sobre el Arroyo. And that was uh, a very important part of the project, to communicate all the visits that uh, architectural yeah, the, yeah, students of architecture the, the came from came different from universities in Argentina to visit the work uh, going on, uh, work in progress. Yeah. So, uh, well, we, we believe that this has been an experience that uh, is quite unusual in Argentina, and for a, for the modern heritage, is uh, is it's almost uh, unique. And you were mentioning all the different stakeholders involved, of the different mm. levels of government. There are moments, there are situations, there are projects where there is also international organizations involved in those processes. And I think this is a good time to bring you into the conversation, Susan, uh, because I, I want to 
expand a bit more uh, our discussion and really talk about modernism in South America and different conservation projects in the region. I know that through the Getty Conservation Institute, you, you have been involved, you, you have supported and been involved in different sites and projects in South America, developing conservation management plan, research, documentation. And I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about how your experience has been working at modernist sites, developing preservation projects at modernist sites in South America. Sure, and um, our role at the GCI, we haven't had any of our own field projects in South America, but as um, Javier said, we funded a number of projects through our Keeping It Modern program, uh, which has helped establish quite a nice network and, and connect that network with others um, doing similar projects internationally. I think that um, one of the things that is really interesting about what's... Um, about conservation of modern he modern architecture in uh, South America is actually it's been going on for a really long time. So the first building ever to the, the youngest building ever to be listed was in Brazil, 1949. The 19 the, the building that was finished, Oscar Niemeyer's um, San Francisco Church in Pampulha, which was finished in 1943, was listed in 1949. So in South America, particularly in Brazil, it's been quite interesting that there's been a recognition that these places are worthy of celebration celebration, conservation and protection very early on. The youngest place ever to be included, inscribed on the World Heritage List was Brasilia, 1987, completed in 1959. Legislation in countries like Brazil um, doesn't have a time limit on it. In many countries you can't list places till they're 50 years old or 30 years old. In some countries in South America, and I'm using Brazil as an example because I know more about their legislative system, they don't have that limit. So very interesting idea that there's a sort of recognition that these places can be worthy of our attention and our conservation pretty early on. And I think there's, um, as a result, been a sort of um, a more natural affinity with conservation um, and there's an incredible network of professionals that are working in these countries to identify, protect and conserve some of the earliest training efforts happened. Uh, the first ICROM, um, uh, one of the first ICROM, which is the International Centre for Conservation and Restoration in Rome, their first training efforts was some in Europe and then again running out of Brazil, but for South American professionals. So there's a fantastic network of pr and very well, a lot of knowledge, skills and experience in this region that we don't always hear about in the English speaking world. Um, so it's been really fantastic for us at the GCI to get to know more about that work and more about these professionals' work and to hear uh, some of their experiences. I think, like in many other parts of the world, many of the problems are shared. Even though what I've just said, there's still... It can be really difficult to get these places actually protected and conserved. There's a lot of development pressure. We have the typical problems of lack of knowledge about how to deal with some of the material challenges, some of the very um, the materials like concrete and steel and you know plastics and all these modern materials that we use. We still don't have really well established, understood techniques for conserving them, nor a body of um, practitioners and con contractors that know how to deal with it. I think that's a a problem that we share no matter where we are. Um, and then, you know, things we were talking today about development pressure and even though I think there's better recognition for modern architecture in, in South America and there in other places, the, the problem still exists about how to get, um, how to stave off some of that development pressure when you've got um, real estate pressure and, um, and, and those sort of things. So I think what we've learned is that there's an untapped... Um, knowledge, skills and experience there that, that we uh, have been able to begin to tap into and share and I think there's a lot more potential for us to, um, for us in North America to, to learn from those experiences and share some of, some of those experiences and um, uh, yeah, that's probably... I want to build up on that, what you just said about the connection between North America and South America and in fact, that's your question, Barry, I believe in 2015, you curated an exhibition at MoMA that focused on modernism in Latin America. And I wonder if you can tell us a bit more about kind of the context in which this house, La Casa Sobre el Arroyo, was built 
in the region and through your experience kind of curating the show? Um, Chris, I just wanted to add a footnote to what Susan said, but a little bit with the risk of shifting our attention to Brazil rather than Argentina, but staying in the southern cone. But one of the really interesting things, and I think not terribly well known because of the divisions between the idea of the history of architecture and preservation practice, is the figure of Lucio Costa, who already in the late 1920s was simultaneously writing manifestos for modernism in the new world, if you will, and also setting up monument preservation in Brazil. So for him, there was absolutely no contradiction whatsoever between modernist creation and an ethos of preservation. But anyway, to the question that you asked me. Um, so this project was illustrated in the book and also in the prelude uh, to the exhibition that we did in 2015 at MoMA, uh, which actually began in 1955. But this was such an important monument uh, for the entire region. Let's use Latin America so we can include that part of North America, which is in Latin America, Mexico. Um, but we had a very interesting discussion among the curatorial team at the time, uh, which, because our objective in bringing this exhibition here was, I said at the time, I have three degrees in architectural history, and I was never taught anything about Latin America. It's one of the big gaps in the northern hemisphere about our southern neighbors. Uh, and you know, we have to wait for textbooks like Jean Louis to really have an integrated view of these things. Um, but we began discussing how did we want to present this work. And we, thought we do not want to present it the way we might have heard about it. These are the pupils of Le Corbusier operating in South America. These are the followers of Mies van der Rohe operating in Mexico and, uh, and various Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. And so our rule was we would never use the word influence. We would never say that this architect was influenced by that architect. Rather, we would say this architect is interested in the work of the other. And if we replace the word influence by interest, we have an active reaching out. So when you look at this building, and we know the role of Amancio Williams in relationship to Le Corbusier, whose name inevitably comes up over and over again, and of course, mm -hmm. another building that will be very involved with uh, is actually as the on-site architect for the uh, famous Courchette House, Courbusier's um, only house in, uh, in South America, also in Argentina. Um, but when we look at this house, of course you can see elements of Courbusier there. You can also see that Amancio Williams, who's probably 28, 29, 30 years old, when he convinces his family that he's going to build them a, a bridge as well as a house and a place for his father to compose his music quietly up in, up in the trees. This is, there is no building anywhere in Europe that you are going to say this is actually inspired by. It is an active statement. If you were want to do it in pure art historical terms, this you know, very young architect says, what happens if I take the five points of Corbusier? I'm completely fascinated with Corbusier, the Villa Savoie, which is 15 years earlier than this house. But I also love the bridges of Maillard. I love the engineering. I love the incredible way in which Maillard can express it. Corbusier never expressed the structure quite so directly as this. Mm -hmm. What happens if I put those two things I'm interested in into creating something mm -hmm. that will have my father's piano up at the level of the birds and will no longer be bothered by the tourists on the main drag. And in Mar del Plata, you get a house which is without, without source, even if it's over a source of water. So you know that was, a, that was a very interesting discussion. Whenever one of the team would say the word influence, one of the other members of the team would stomp on their foot and say, what is the interest here? How do, how do we turn this into an act of creation rather than some kind of notion? of copying. We wanted, this, we wanted to say that many of these centers uh, of creativity in modernist art and architecture literature uh, in the region were creating things of their own that were sending out messages for the rest of the world. What if we looked at actually the interest that Europeans and North Americans might have in this instead of the other way around? Uh, excuse me, as uh, Barry said, I would say uh, when you have a masterpiece, as the masterpiece of great architects, there are many influences you can uh, uh, read and uh, make interpretation of the different influences. As uh, Barry said, is the bridges of Maillard. Uh, 
Williams, uh, uh, Amancio Williams, uh, got the degree of architect, and then he wanted to, and he started to study engineering. Oh, he never finished, but he was very interested in the work of engineer. And then if we see this part is all like, uh, well, the, the Maillard's bridges, but here starts the metal structure. So he was attentive to many other projects like uh, Le Corbusier, uh, the Pavillon Suisse at the Cité Universitaire, for instance. And this is interesting. When we were preparing this series to show uh, architects or students or even different audiences from the uh, National Commission of Monuments, and we were preparing the different uh, uh, classes or doc small documentaries. It was my turn to analyze uh, the influence of the references or whatever. And uh, I found a, a sort of uh, uh, a text of Amancio uh, stating how, uh, and, and, and uh, saying how was his experience in 1934 then when the Graf Zeppelin, uh, this uh, uh, German, how would you say in English, dirigible, dirigible, uh, dirigible, dirigible. dirigible <laughs> arrived in South America in Buenos Aires. He, uh, he had uh, learned how to be a, a, a plane pilot, and he was escorting with several other uh, planes and pilots the Graf Zeppelin arriving in Buenos Aires and then landing in the outskirts. He says was amazed by the shape, by the size. And if we see this, it's a little bit, this is a part of the dirigible, and you put it upside down, this is the cage that usually you have in those dirigibles where the people were staying and looking through these long windows. So, we can make many interpretations, but uh, that of uh, the, the air, <laughs> air ships of the period may have also influenced the design of this building. Well, it's, it's true, actually, if you think about the way that you arrive in this house, I'm not so sure you, if you pick that up in the, in, the, in the video, you're climbing up over the bridge. You go, it's almost like those very early airplanes that drop a, yeah. you know, yeah, drop, yeah, yeah, a, yeah. drop a staircase from the fuselage and you yeah. climb up into it. So you go through a service area that's glazed there and you continue, and the whole center of the house is bisected yeah. by a kind of canal. And you see the, 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 the distribution of, of uh, you know, no, the, the room of the places in, in, in this dirigible, like the Zeppelin and others, it's like very close to the uh, composition of this part of the house. Yeah. Believe it or not, we are running out of time, <laughs> 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 which, is, which is very sad because it's... Can I just add one thing which is really yes, interesting? Yes, please. Um, a number of publications on the house with historic documents, but one of the few that didn't appear in the video was a construction si sign on the site when the work began, for which is really a family project. Uh, the architectural office was the architectural office of Amancio Williams and his wife, Delfina Galvez. She had gone to architecture school. They met as students, and they opened their own office in 1941, I think two years before the commission from her father-in-law, if you will, mm -hmm. and the sign, and I wonder how early this is, the sign says, you know, work underway, Amancia Williams, Defina Galvez Pungue de, de Williams. And it's very important because the architects, women, are not recognized in Argentina in that moment, so it's very important for, for us this, to, to, show to the people how this woman work in this project and how she she do many things because the first of all in the house she relevates how to say when the service the, yeah no when she relevó todos los árboles yeah she makes the job of the site to put the, the house in this place because she don't want to cut any of these trees so it's very important for her to elevate all the, the landscape. And Sorry, just one. Yeah. No, 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 I'm actually glad that you brought this up because it was one of the questions that I wanted to ask, but since we are running out of time, but the, the role of kind of this partnership between a husband and a wife working together on, on a family house, I think it's quite unique and interesting. I, we are running out of time, but I wanna give the opportunity to the audience to at least ask one or perhaps two questions. So if someone has a question, please, please raise your hand. Uh, 
Greetings. I'm just curious how um, large the park is today. How, what is the acreage? The acreage. Uh, or can you translate two hectares <laughs> into acres? <laughs> so two hectares. Two hectares. Yeah. Thank you. There was uh, the, there was another part of the of the plot that was owned by one of Amancio's Williams uh, uh, brothers, and he tried to design. He made a design for another modern building in that part. But his father said no, and he built a sort of revival of whatever. You don't understand the movement. But I did have a question about, yeah. about uh, the current use of the house, and I would also add the current use and what is the future? What are the future plans for the house? It's a museum, yeah. <laughs> now it's open for the people. It's a museum. It's one of the huge desafios. It's challenges. one of the challenges. So I. Uh, challenges uh, to do all the the um, uh, the project for for the museum, right? All the the project in the landscape, all the project in the in the house, because the this house have a limited limited capacity, limited capacity for the people. So and we have a lot of demand. So it's very important to do. Uh, um, yeah. Manage yeah. all what different, and even let me um, let me explain yeah, sure. this because you have been working on this, and to build a small pavilion, yeah. not f uh, to use the inside spaces for offices or for whatever, no. to uh, keep it as much clear as possible, you know. So this is one of the future uh, projects uh, that uh, the house uh, needs to to accomplish. To I have a question real quick. The, sure. The original furnishings for the house, were they in the family? Was there an attempt to return the actual furniture and other um, uh, equipment back to the house? Yes. 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 Sure. Well, especially Magali was after, uh, yes, uh, different pieces of the furniture. Some of them were found. Some others uh, were well, searched for a similar piano as uh, Amancio Williams' father had in that uh, in that area. For well, for the lighting fixtures and so on, were lost. And thanks to the original drawings, they were replicated exactly. And uh, well, for the rest, uh, well, the null chair will be <laughs> uh, installed inside there. It matches perfectly. And for the rest, uh, well, uh, also part of uh, I, I would say that uh, the the price, the, the 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 money of the price would will, will come to Claudia will give me one of the, the, the Claudia the, the one of the tables is going to be original tables so to complete the whole as much as possible. I think we need to leave it here. Um, but I'm just going to say one more note, because you told us that the house is so popular that it's sold out uh, until next year. So if you want to visit the house, uh, house museum that it is now, you need to wait until two, uh, 2025 to visit it, right? That's, uh, I guess it's a great success. Thank you so much for <laughs> being in the panel. We now. Stay, stay, stay here for a couple more minutes. We now have reached the end of the panel, but um, we are now going to proceed to give uh, the award to uh, Magali and Fabio. So I want to invite Benedict de Monla and Katie Kim and uh, Barry as representative of uh, the jury. To and I, I just want to say that we also thank the government of Argentina because the story is that it was put on the watch. And then what happened is that the government of Ar Ar Argentina bought the place. That's what allowed the restoration. Mm -hmm. So that's a really exceptional story as well, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, and it's, then it takes much more than a village. It takes a country. So in your, <laughs> we are giving you the prize, and you are represented many, many, many oh, people, yeah, and yeah, thank yeah, them yeah. all. Yeah. So thank you.